He is risen. 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 He is
Well, when Jesus declared Himself to be Messiah, He did that on Palm Sunday, and we celebrated that last week. Number four, He would be betrayed by a friend and wounded in His hands. Judas betrayed Jesus, who was arrested that same night and crucified the next morning. Number five, He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, what Judas was paid. Number six, the money would be used to buy a potter's field. Now, Judas, the Bible tells us he had remorse and he ended up throwing the coins back into the temple. But the priests now viewed that as blood money, so they couldn't pick the coins back up and put them in the temple treasury. Instead, they used the money to buy a potter's field in which they could bury foreigners. And all of this is mentioned in Matthew's gospel. Number seven, he would be silent before his accusers as Jesus was. And number eight, he would die with his hands and his feet pierced. Now, when David wrote this, Rome did not exist and crucifixion did not exist. So, let's aside, uh, set aside for a moment the fact that all of this perfectly fits with Jesus. Humanly speaking, what would be the chances of one ordinary man fulfilling these eight prophecies, given the fact that such a man would have to be born at the right place, born at the right time, betrayed by the right person, for the right reason, at the right price, and he would die in the prescribed way as God's Word had predicted? Well, the college professor in his class found that the probability of one man fulfilling all eight of these prophecies would be one in ten to the seventeenth power. That's one with seventeen zeros behind it. And that was a conservative estimate. Humanly speaking, they said it would be the same chance as filling the state of Texas with ten to the seventeen silver dollars. That would fill the state of Texas two feet deep. Now, that's a lot of money. Then mark one of those silver dollars with an X and stir the mix together all across the state, and then you would drop in a blindfolded person, helicopter in a blindfolded person, give him or her one chance, one chance only to go through the entire state of Texas and at one moment just reach down once and retrieve that marked silver dollar. Now, I'm not a betting man, but those odds don't sound very good to me. And that's only for eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled more than a hundred. You see, only God could pull this off. And even more so when it comes to the resurrection, because humanly speaking, the probability of that is zero. So it must be supernatural. God directed, God initiated. Well, Jesus fulfilled 39 Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah's death and resurrection, and here are two of them. This one says Messiah would be assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Yes, Messiah would die. And Jesus died between two criminals and died a criminal's death, and His body would have been thrown aside with the other criminals had it not been for two of His own disciples. And then He received a proper burial in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah continues, after Messiah has suffered, God declares that He will see the light of life and be satisfied. Well, that's the resurrection. And by His knowledge, God the Father says, my righteous servant will justify many. And there's that word again, justify. He will also bear their iniquities. That prophecy has Jesus written all over it. Another prophecy given to King David was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. Concerning Messiah, David writes, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure in death. Why? Because God, Father God, you will not abandon your son to the realm of the dead. In other words, you will not leave him there. You will not let your faithful one see decay. Well, David died and he was buried. But David's physical descendant, Jesus, he died and was buried and rose from the dead. You can see why Psalm 16 becomes a popular preaching text in the early church to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised son of David. Well, not only was the resurrection of Jesus predicted in the Old Testament, but Jesus talks about it repeatedly from the outset of His ministry. Early on, Jesus said to the religious leaders, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, John tells us that Jesus was referring here to the temple of His body, that after Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled what Jesus had said and they believed the Scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record that Jesus spoke to the 12 disciples about rising from the dead on at least three occasions. 
Jesus began explaining to them how He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Of course, the disciples, they didn't understand this, and they were greatly distressed by it. But over a period of several months, Jesus continued to remind them, beginning at Caesarea Philippi, where it was revealed to Peter that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then a second time when they were back in Galilee, and later on still, a third time as Jesus makes His way up to Jerusalem for that final week and is being lifted up on the cross. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus instructed Peter, James, and John, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised. To His accusers, Jesus replied, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. You see, Jesus permitted His life to be taken to accomplish the purposes of God. You see, Following the Last Supper, Jesus and His disciples making their way up to the Mount of Olives, and it's during this time Jesus will comfort them and let them know where He will meet up with them after He is risen. And then surprisingly, no, not surprisingly, after He has risen, Jesus opens their minds to understand the Scriptures, and He says, this is what is written, and He tells them again, the Messiah will suffer, and He will rise from the dead on the third day. Now, Jesus has said all of this, and it leads us to the observation made by C.S. Lewis, the great intellectual of the 20th century. Lewis stated that a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher, contrary to popular opinion. Because if Jesus wasn't God, then either His claims were false, which would make Him a liar, or Jesus did not know His claims were false, which would make Him a lunatic on the same level as a man who says he's a poached egg. I'm quoting Lewis there. That wasn't me. That was Lewis. Either Jesus is a liar or a lunatic, or He is Lord, in which case Lewis says we should all fall down at His feet and worship Him, and that is that. Well, that's exactly what Lewis did. He became a follower of Jesus. Now, remember, we are not saved by intellectual arguments. We are saved by grace. There will always be people who will not be convinced by any sort of evidence. There will always be someone who will want to endlessly debate the evidence put in front of them. Jesus said, some will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That's Luke chapter 16. Well, I found the best solution for those who are skeptical is to ask them to ask Jesus directly. I just encourage them, ask Him for yourself. If you don't believe God exists, even if you don't believe God exists, Say, Jesus, if you're really God, if you're really who you say you are, reveal yourself to me. Now, that's a step of faith, and I believe that God will honor that step of faith, and He will answer you. Well, the apostles followed Jesus by basing their preaching and teaching on the promises of Scripture. Peter and Paul would use this prophecy of Psalm 16 to show that Jesus fulfilled this promise. He died, and He was buried, and His body did not see decay he was raised to life three days later. Well, the number two reason we can know Christ has been raised today is because of the empty tomb, the tomb where Jesus was buried. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and was granted permission. Along with Joseph was someone we all remember earlier from John chapter 3 we spoke about two weeks ago, Nicodemus, the man who came to see Jesus at night. He brought 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, the Bible says, and taking jo uh, Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen, according to Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden, we are told, was a brand new tomb. Now, we are also told in Matthew's gospel that the tomb belonged to Joseph and that he was rich, which makes sense because only someone well-to-do could afford a tomb like this. And Mark tells us that a very large stone covered the entrance. The point here is that Jesus was buried according to Scripture and that He was buried in a prominent location. There would have been lots of eyes watching what was happening there. Well, this tomb also had guards. 
Sir, the chief priests and the Pharisees said to Pilate, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people he's been raised from the dead. And this last, this deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, the guards may have been Levitical temple guards, but more likely they were Roman soldiers because later we are told in Scripture they're referred to as soldiers. They carried the authority of the government, and they were to ensure that the tomb was secured, as ordered by Pilate, the Roman governor, placing the imperial seal on the stone using wax and some rope. And if you valued your life, you would not tamper with that seal. It seems to me a bit of a stretch to think that a bunch of fishermen and a tax collector could get anywhere near this tomb, tamper with it, or overpower a group of trained Roman soldiers who were guarding this tomb with their lives. But as we all know, the rest is history, history that was changed forever. Because we read in the Scriptures, after the Sabbath, at dawn on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. The Bible says there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and His clothes were white as snow. The guards who were, were so afraid, the Bible says, so afraid of this angel that they shook and became like dead men. They were paralyzed. Now, big stuff is happening here, but let's follow the guards for a moment. Some of them went into the city later on and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. The Bible says that when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Now, we should point out that the only written source we have from this time period where Jewish leaders are calling the resurrection of Jesus into question is the one that you and I have right here in front of us, the one that's actually in the Bible. Now, talk about honest reporting. The only Jewish document from the first century that criticizes the resurrection is what Matthew himself has recorded for us. If we didn't have this record, all we'd be hearing right now is crickets. Well, let's go back to the tomb. Matthew says that an angel rolled away the stone. Now, that explains why the soldiers were terrified, and they would have to now come up with some kind of explanation to save their lives because they had failed to do their job. Their own necks were now on the chopping block. What I find so amazing about the stone being rolled away by the angel is not that it was done to let Jesus out. The angel said to the women very clearly, He is not here, He has risen, just as He said. No, that stone was rolled back on that Easter Sunday to let people in, that anyone who was willing to look inside could see that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. Come and see, the angel said. Friends, Jesus is alive. Can we give God some praise for that this morning in the house? Can we just lift up some praise and thank Him? Amen. Well, history has been changed forever by His story, the resurrection of Jesus. Now, morning turns to to evening, the Bible tells us, and the Gospel of John reminds us that on the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Luke picks up the story from here and notes that the disciples were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. Jesus says to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So this is where we find the disciples that evening, hunkered down behind locked doors, hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities. Of course, that doesn't stop Jesus from entering. He simply appeared. Maybe He walked through the wall or walked through the locked door. 
Jesus can do anything, but I also know that a, resurrect, a re- resurrection body can do all kinds of things that our bodies can't. Jesus was not a ghost. He could be touched by the disciples, and He ate in their presence, the Bible says. He was no longer in that tomb. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Well, number three, we can know Christ has been raised today because of the women's testimony. Now, we read that when the women came back to the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But the Bible says that the disciples did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. What I find so amazing about this passage is how Jesus affirms this group of women, and He gives them a great place of honor, becoming the first eyewitnesses to His resurrection, becoming the first evangelists who will go and tell the good news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. You know, in that culture and in that time, A woman's testimony was not valid. It couldn't be used in a court of law. Women's rights were not as they should have been. But Jesus, He validated their testimony. He wanted them to be the first ones to see Him. He made them and He made their testimony the number one priority after He had risen. Now, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, the Christian message would simply have gotten nowhere. And the thing about the women seeing Jesus alive, well, that would have only added fuel to the fire. Number four, we can know Christ has been raised today because of the resurrection appearances. And there were many. We have 12 of them in the New Testament that are documented. In some cases, only one person that saw Jesus, like Mary or Peter, but the vast majority were groups of people, people in various locations, by the sea or on a mountain. Notice the bottom of the list. Jesus saves his final two conversations for James, his half-brother, who didn't believe in Jesus at all. When you read about him in the gospel accounts, he didn't have any faith in Jesus. And then Paul, who prior to meeting Jesus was going around and he was putting Christians in jail and even approving of them being killed. You see, God understands people better than we do. He knows their hearts and He can reach into their lives wherever they are, no matter how indifferent or how broken they are. So let's continue praying for the people in our lives who are broken and indifferent. Well, the fact remains that Jesus visited many people at one time. Here's a fascinating report from the Apostle Paul, you know, after he becomes a Christian. Paul writes, Jesus was seen by more than 500 of His followers at the same time, most of whom, Paul said, were still alive. In effect, Paul was saying, you don't believe me? Go ahead, check my sources, ask around, ask those who were there. They're still around if you want to ask them. Well, let's face it, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, it would have been extremely difficult for so many people to safeguard a lie. Take the modern-day example of Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson was involved in the Watergate scandal of the 1970s. Colson and his colleagues wound up going to prison for their involvement in the cover-up, and while he was in prison, Chuck Colson met Jesus. He was born again. And following his release from prison, he began what is known today as prison fellowship. Chuck Colson said that his experience with Watergate convinced him that the biblical accounts of the resurrection of Jesus were completely reliable, and they were trustworthy. Why does he say this? Well, because Chuck knew firsthand, from firsthand experience, that it was impossible for any group of people, in this case men who were powerful and highly motivated professionals, to keep a secret based on a lie. He said their cover-up lasted lasted less than a month, and yet somehow Christ's followers who were powerless, all of them went to their deaths, many of them facing horrific forms of execution, all because they chose to maintain their testimony that they had seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. As Chuck Colson observes, men and women do not give up their comfort, and they certainly do not give up their lives for what they know to be a lie. Well, number five, we can know that Christ has been raised today because of the transformed disciples. Disciples like Peter. Remember Peter, the night of Jesus' trial, publicly denying Him three times? And yet, 50 days later, here we find a completely different Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, standing in front of thousands of people, 
declaring on behalf of the other disciples that God has raised this Jesus to life. And Peter says, we are all witnesses of it. Or like John, who having faced torture in prison on the island of Patmos, writes, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. John says, we saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Or Thomas, you all remember doubting Thomas? The one who refused to believe in Jesus unless he saw the marks in Jesus' hands and was able to put his finger where the nail, nails had been and put his hand into the side of Jesus where he had been speared. When he finally appears to Thomas, Jesus says to him, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas's reply says everything to us this morning. He said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. In 2018, our Hillcrest India team visited St. Thomas Mount in Chennai, and it was there the Apostle Thomas was chased up a hill by an angry mob and was martyred for his faith in Jesus after having planted church after church after church throughout India. One minute in the presence of his resurrected Lord turns Thomas from being a doubter into a trailblazer for Christ. Well, number six, we can know Christ has been raised today because of the church beginning in Jerusalem. Now, this is fascinating. We read here in Luke's gospel that Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures and tells them, Messiah will suffer and rise according to the Scriptures on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations. And where does it start? Beginning at Jerusalem. Later, He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And again, he says to them, when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And where does it start? In Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? If the resurrection never took place here, that would be the worst place to begin. The place where Jesus was killed, where His body was buried, the place that everyone knew about it, burned into the minds of everyone who lived there be better off going to North Africa or somewhere nobody knew about Jesus at that time and start there if, in fact, Jesus had not risen from the dead. Anywhere but Jerusalem. And yet this is not the case. The church began right here, and on the first day we're told that 3,000 new believers were added to the church, beginning in that very place where people had been touched by the resurrected Lord Jesus. And finally, number seven this morning, we know Christ has been raised because He is still changing lives. Has He changed your life today? Well, He has changed mine, and He is changing people who have been impacted by the lives that have been impacted by Jesus. I think of notable people as well, like Billy Graham or William Wilberforce, who fought for the abolition of slavery, or Martin Luther King Jr., and the Civil Rights Movement, or Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing, or Galileo, the father of modern science, ordinary people in the hands of an extraordinary Savior who continues to change hearts and minds, save, heal, transform lives, and alter destinies in ways that bring blessing and hope to others. Well, as we conclude this morning, does anyone here know the name of that famous clock tower in London? Just shout it out if you know. Big Ben, world famous. Our family had the privilege of seeing Big Ben in 2016. Did you know that the chime used in Big Ben is based on the variation of four notes and that those four notes make up the fifth and sixth bars of I know that my Redeemer liveth from Handel's Messiah. It's the most commonly used chime for clocks around the world. At one time, people in London set their clocks, set their time, set their lives by that clock and its world-famous chime. Well, God is calling you and I to set our lives by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Job, who lived thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, Look forward to that glorious day when his Savior would return and Job's faith would become sight. Listen to Job's amazing declaration of faith this morning. Job says this, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. 
that in the end He will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. What's in your heart this morning? You know that there is a Redeemer who lives for you today. His name is Jesus, and He loves you this much. He died for you on the cross. God has always loved you, but more than that, He wants to save you. Your sins have separated you from God. Jesus came to fix that. Jesus came to make it possible for you and I to come to God and one day to live with Him forever. If you haven't done so already, I can think of no better day than on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, to give your life to the King of Kings. Let's take a moment to bow our hearts before God and close our eyes. And if you'd like to pray this prayer, pray to open the door of your life to Jesus, you can repeat this prayer after me and make it your very own. You can pray this prayer. Say, Dear God, I know that my sin has put a barrier between you and me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin so that the barrier can be removed. Lord Jesus, I trust in you alone for the forgiveness of my sins and I accept your free gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Well, if you've made that decision today or re recommitted your life to God, please let us know because we'd love to walk with you in your decision. Let me encourage you today to do three things. First of all, pick up a Bible. Download the YouTube or the uh, YouVersion Bible app. Begin reading the New Testament because God will speak to you and strengthen you through His Word. Second thing to do today is to pray. Prayer is simply talking to God like you're talking to a trusted friend. You can do this while walking outside or writing uh, down your thoughts on a piece of paper or drawing out your prayers. You can get creative. You can tell God all of your problems and let Him care for you. And thirdly, participate in a local church family where the Bible is taught, the good news is proclaimed, and people are following Jesus together because the church is a hospital for sinners. We don't have it all together. We are learners. So let me pray for us as we close today's Easter service. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father God, for this Easter Sunday 2021 and another day to live for you. Bless those here today who have turned their lives over to you. Strengthen your church. Bless our families and our places of work. Continue to fill us with resurrection power to serve you in this season. Guide us and direct us for your glory and for the blessing of those around us. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you His perfect peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend. God bless you. We will see you next Sunday.